let's talk about what it is. So we want to talk about decision problems in general, and the point of talking about decision problems in general is that we want eventually to talk about reinforcement learning, and reinforcement learning is a type of decision problem. But it's also a kind of learning problem, so uh, we have to go through all that a little bit. So, let's see. So the first thing we'll talk about is beliefs and probabilities. So how can we use probabilities to represent what we know? And then we'll talk about some different types of decision problems, uh, starting from simple decisions like do you want beer or wine, to more complicated things like planning. And we'll talk about, about base decisions and what does it mean to be based when you make decisions. Yeah. So the basic reinforcement learning problem is a topic of this course and it's a very participatory course and it's only many lecturing half of the week and the rest of the week is more participation and so the reinforcement learning problem is kind of a problem of learning by interaction and reinforcement so you have to interact with your environment and you have to learn by doing you cannot just get some data and learn from this data that you have and say okay, this I have learned something now you have to test your knowledge by actually doing an experiment in the real world but we actually not have anything real so in the course we'll just, we'll just do simulations instead but basically you have some kind of agent you need to learn something and then you try what is learned in the simulation world and then you kind of see what, how well it does and if it does well then it says yeah great and it has to improve okay now the interesting thing about this is that optimal behavior is only defined through rewards it's not defined through some uh, let's say direct feedback that says okay you did perfectly or uh, you could improve this or you could do this better so you only do something and then you get some reward and you kind of try and think is there some other thing I could have done to get more reward and the other problem you have to face is that when you start in reinforcement learning you mostly know very few things about the world you're acting in so you have to do a lot of learning and it's hard to be optimal when you don't know anything right so you have to balance what you know already with what you want to know in order to become better but trying out risky things can be very bad for you because you can lose lots of reward yeah. so that's the last point so actually to learn you have to actually collect data in the optimal way so in a way that gives you as much information as possible but which doesn't lose you too much reward at the same time okay so if someone tells you okay you can sell your soul for knowledge of everything maybe that's too bad you cannot do that but maybe you can read some books it's maybe a bit of uh, too much time consuming but you maybe learn uh, enough uh, that is useful for you um, okay so let's talk about the basic problem that you have in the decision problems we, we care about the basic problem is uncertainty and uncertainty doesn't have anything to do with let's say randomness specifically it does that we don't know enough to predict the future that's generally true and because actually we also have uncertainty about the past so we're not sure what happened in the past Maybe we have heard some rumors, maybe we have read some history books, but we can never know for sure. So a way to represent the uncertainty that we're going to use in the course is probabilities, okay? And there are other ways to do it, but everybody is basically using uh, probabilities, so we're also going to use it, okay? Um, so just a reminder, what's the probability, okay? So the usual way to think about probabilities is probabilities of events things that happen or don't happen okay so say a is one thing and b is another thing we we'll say a is bad weather in Gothenburg and b is good weather in Gothenburg so if you think that a is the bad weather is more likely than good weather then you say that the probability of uh, good weather is lower than that of bad weather okay so there are only three things to remember about probability okay the probability of any event is always between zero and one one means perfectly certain event zero means impossible event the probability of the null event, like a special event that never happens, is always zero. And if you have any two events that are mutually exclusive, then the sum of the probabilities is equal to the probability of either of them happening. Okay? So if, uh, say, for example, my age, you don't know my age exactly, but you say, okay, maybe he's between 13 and 40, maybe between 40 and 50. Okay? So you say, okay, fine. I have some probability for either of them. Let's say uh, for the first one that I am, let's say, 10% and for the second one 90% so then you're 100% sure that I'm between 13 and 50 okay so that's a simple example good right 
So the way to think about this uh, in order to learn, right? This is fine for setting up some uh, thing that doesn't learn anything. But if you want to actually use it for learning, then you have to think about how you're actually going to update your knowledge given evidence, right? And a typical thing to do is to say that you have a set of models and every model that you have in your set ma makes a prediction. And based on the prediction of this model and what actually happens, you can update your knowledge about this model. So let's take a very simple example. You have two possible events. Omega-1 is going to rain. Omega-2 is not going to rain. Yeah. So keeping it simple, these events are now mutually exclusive events. Either one happens, well, but not both of them at the same time. And let's say that before you see anything, any data, you believe, because you live in the body, that it's going to rain with 80% probability, okay, tomorrow, without knowing anything else. <coughs> so now we want to use this knowledge uh, to be able to, to learn something about the future. So to use this knowledge, we use what we call the definition of conditional probability. Conditional probability is just the way of saying that what happens um, what's the probability of one event happening if some other event already happened? Yeah, and the usual way to define this is to say that the probability of event X happening if even omega happened is the probability of both events of the events happening divided by the probability of the second event. I remind you that this is a definition; it's not written in stone or anything, but this is a definition that is used almost everywhere. Yeah. There are sometimes reasons to use something different, but. Uh, almost never used in practice. Okay. So what we care about um, for our predictions is to be able to predict the probability of rain given that the weather forecaster will tell us that it's going to be sunny tomorrow. Okay. So this is a little exercise you can try out on paper uh, right now. And basically it says, let's say that we know Okay, that the probability that the forecaster says sun when it's raining, okay, is going to be fifty percent, and the probability that the forecaster when it's going to rain tomorrow, the probability and the forecaster says it's going to be uh, right. So here on the right side is the probability of it's the event that it's actually raining. So when it's actually going to rain. 50% of the time, the forecaster says, yeah, it's going to be sunny, don't worry about it, okay? So you get wet, because you don't take your umbrella. Yeah. But whenever it's going to be actually sunny, then the forecaster is always correct, okay? so he's never wrong. Okay. So now, given that you have some prior probability, before you see the forecast, that it's going to rain with 80% probability, then the question is, what is the probability of rain for you tomorrow, given the forecast that says sun, and given what you know about the forecast, that how often he's wrong. Okay. You can try it on in, in pairs if you like. It's like. So the trick basically is to use Bayes' theorem, which is right here. And here you can combine your prior probability of rain with the probability of the forecast of seeing sun when it's actually going to be sunny or rainy, and dividing by this. And you can use it because the events of rain or not rain are mutually exclusive. So their intersection is zero. And there is no other event that's possible. It's either rain or no rain. So in our scenario, rain or dry. So we don't consider snow or sleet or hurricane or anything like that. Okay. okay. 
everybody knows how to do that, I guess. Cool. So you should have gotten that even though the forecast is the sun and even though he's always perfectly correct when it's actually sunny, our posterior probability is going to be quite low uh, for sunny weather. We're not quite sure that it's going to be sunny tomorrow. Okay? Because we had quite a strong prior that it's going to be rainy in the first place. And secondly, we know that he's not very accurate uh, when it's actually raining, right? So he, his predictions on one side are good, but on the other side they're bad. And this is a common problem uh, when you're interpreting probabilities. Uh, a lot of times you look at this accuracy and say, well, it must be pretty accurate. Like in DNA testing, you say, okay, the, the probability of a false positive is kind of wrong, uh, very, very low. But if you consider posterior probabilities, then lots of times the calculations you get are more like numbers like these than numbers like these. Okay. And what I mentioned before about um, the events summing up to one, summing up to everything that is po possible, is very important because a lot of times when you look at probabilities of things that are true or not true, you forget the possibility that there might be some things that might be true that you're not even considering. So if you use Bayesian reasoning to confirm or disprove a hypothesis or any kind of statistical reasoning, you basically always limit yourself to a finite universe or some universe of hypothesis. And when you make this explicit, it's better. But you should always think about what you have left out. What is the thing that I'm not considering as a possible explanation or as a possible hypothesis about the world? Yeah. So here we consider rain or dry, but maybe there's another event that we don't even think about that would be relevant uh, in our setting. Okay. So that's the basics of, of Bayesian statistics. So that's everything you basically need to know for this course um, about probability. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about more how you're going to use it. Uh, the main way you're going to use probability in this course is by describing distributions uh, in terms of families of models. So you can think of a model as a way to describe the world. So a model tells you what was going to happen with what probability, given what has happened in the past. And you can have a set of, a very large set of models, theta. You can consider every model theta as a very complicated meteorological model, for example. And given some data in the input, it gives you some data in the output. What's going to happen? Okay. Or you can think about a very large climate model for the whole Earth. Okay. Maybe none of these models are true, but that's okay. You can still use them to make predictions about the future, right? So we know that meteorological models are not true, in the sense that they never give perfect predictions. They have disagreements between each other. But you can still use them in a useful way, OK? So that's basically our setting here. And what we want to basically get most of the time is find what is the right model, or what is the best model, or alternatively, what is the best prediction we can make given all the models that we have? Because maybe none of them are perfectly correct, but some of them are good enough that we can use them and go in a combined way to make a prediction about the future. Okay? And this is the basic Bayesian idea. Um, we start by saying that we don't know what's the right model, and we assign a specific probability to every model. And here, I deliberately use a different symbol for probability than before, xi or xi, just to emphasize the fact that this is something separate from, let's say, a real world distribution. This is a distribution that we define in a subjective way to, uh, let's say, demonstrate what we think is the right model. Okay? Is this part clear? Okay. So this is the same equation as before, just now written in different notation. So here we have our prior probability about every model. And here we have the posterior probability of every model given the evidence x. I don't say what the x is, it can be any sequence of data, graph data, anything, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the probability assigned to data x by model theta. So every model gives you a different probability for your data. And the only thing you do basically is you, you scale your prior by an amount proportional to this probability for every model. And that's all you do, and then you normalize. So this is a very simple calculation, at least for a finite number of models. and it can lead to very nice uh, properties that we're going to see in a few minutes. Actually, you can prove that, we'll show it later, you can prove that your 
Bayesian predictor, the one that averages all the models according to their current probability, is doing almost as well as the best possible model in your set, which is uh, actually a surprising result, but it's very simple to show. So just to illustrate a bit more what we mean by world models and beliefs, let's say that you have a very simple type of belief assigning equal probability to this model, and you are, you are the rat, okay, and you're trying to find the cheese. And you don't know where which maze you are in, you know, but you know there are two mazes, and you know you're here, and you know that this is always there, but you don't know if this is this maze here, which has a shortcut, or it's this other maze where you have to go around, okay? So if it's this one, then, well, you have to spend more time going around. Uh, if it's that one, it's a bit faster, okay? So what can we do? Well, if you're that, basically you can experiment. You can try and follow a particular trajectory, and then if this trajectory actually obtains, you can be sure that it's world one or world two. Okay. So your evidence is basically the path that you actually take through the maze. It doesn't matter how it's generated, you generate it somehow. And every model of these two assigns some probability to this evidence. And here you see that this one doesn't match the matches the evidence, but this one doesn't match it. It's not possible to go through here. Yeah. So what happens is that you assign a zero probability now to this model because the probability of actually going through there is zero. So now you are perfectly sure that this, this model one is the right model. Okay? So now let's make a little exercise, uh, again on paper, in the beginning. Let's say we have the model that we had before, and we have n meteorological stations. Every station is a different one, let's say mu i, and it gives you probabilities of rain, given the past events of rain or not rain. Yeah. For the first part, we don't need to actually have anything specific about uh, know anything specific about how many possible events are we just have some belief at time t which is the belief that you have conditioned on everything in the past and we want to define the next belief in terms of the current belief okay so here you have to use Bayes rule again Bayes theorem but you should kind of derive it in a in a recursive way so that the next belief only depends on the current belief and the current data. So basically it will be a factor of this and this and this, right? Basically. And then later we can talk about how you can write a little function that computes this as a little exercise. You can free, feel free to talk about it or ask something. So the question is to derive the next step belief. Yeah, so the next step belief only in terms of the current belief. So to write it a bit more clearly, uh, let me go to this scene number two.
So you basically have your new belief or writing and this is basically something times this one right so this is your previous belief and this is your next one right? and this kind of simple Just a hint uh, to make it a bit easier. So basically, the this one, right? If you write the recursion, you can actually show that the probability of of the model at time t is basically the probability of the model from the prior condition on all the data until time t minus one. Okay, because at, at time t you don't see all the data. You see y1, you have your initial uh, belief here. You see data y1, and this creates your belief at time 1. Then you see data y2, and this creates belief at time 2, and so on. So then you can think about. So if you just want to calculate the probability of the model under this belief, you just the same as looking at this the probability of the model at time t is basically the probability of the prior probability of the model conditioned on all the data so this is just from the definition we have given before so basically it follows directly from here
does anybody want to go ahead and write it up on the board or talk to me about it or ask a question or we can have another five minutes just need to use the Bayes theorem and this definition. If you don't remember Bayes theorem, it's here again. Now the only thing that you have to remember is that here it's slightly different. Um, we are conditioning on everything. So this is just, the interesting thing here is that this is just defined for the data, but in our setting now we said that time t the models have already the data until time t minus one but that's okay we can still just replace it in fact so that's the shortcut So the important thing to note is that Bayes' rule, when you apply it, it applies to any extra conditioning. So, oops, wrong button. So, basically what, what does Bayes' rule say? It says P of A given B is P of B given A times p of a divided by p of b, right? Now the funny thing is that you can just write the same equation again condition on another event. There's no problem with that. These are all just new distributions, okay? And remember this basically is just the sum of these guys. Now in our case, what we have is, well, this one is uh, the model, right? This one is data that's coming now, and this is all the data until now. Yeah. So you have the same thing now. You have given all the data. Is probability according to this model of the new data given the old data okay and then and then divide by the sum of the same thing above okay so I'm not writing it again but this guy here I'm just define it to be CT plus one and this one will define to be XCT. Hmm. So this is basically uh, the proof. And you can rewrite it again if you like. So you have the probability of all the data, if you prefer. But you will get the same thing. OK? So it is possible, indeed, to rewrite Bayes' theorem in that form, okay? And it doesn't matter how the models are created, right? Every model can depend in arbitrary way in the past, okay? The trick here is that everything is conditioned on the past. So everything here, so this is, we define this to be the probability of new given all the data until time t minus one, right? So everything is conditioned on the past here. So this makes it nice uh, and simple. So our next belief is just the prior, the previous step, times the new data likelihood. Okay. 
This is very important because it allows you to use Bayes' theorem in a recursive way. So you don't really have to remember all your data in some sense. The only thing you have to remember is to remember the, prior, the, the current prior, or the current posterior. Yeah? And then when you have predictions by your models, and every model gives you a different probability for the next event, you don't even have to care how it computes it. It just gives you probability. Things okay, you gave me this probability, so now I'm going to weigh you up or down depending on how likely the thing that you predict actually was. Yeah. So most of you don't have computers, I hear, I think, but I guess it's better if you do have them next time. Uh, but for now, you could try and write a little Python function like or like a pseudo code that computes this, just to see how it uh, feels like, because it's a very simple loop basically. So the Python function, you can say it has a couple of arguments. So let's say it has, okay, let's see. Let's So you can think of some function which has as input three arguments. One is the prior. It's a vector with length n. Okay, so these are the inputs. It has predictions. Which is basically a matrix, I put it in uh, quotation matrix because some languages don't have a matrix, it just have a double arrays or something like that, or double lists, uh, n times m, where m is the number of possible events. And predictions ij is basically the probability according to model i that the next observation is j given all the data until now okay and of course this is not enough right is it we have the prior we have the predictions do we need something else Mm, yeah, we have the actual outcome, right? In 1 to M. Okay? So given all these three things, what you believed before, what the predictions of every model were, and what's the outcome, you can compute the posterior, right? So that's a very simple calculation, but we're going to build on this later. It's not like a something out of the blue. Go and get some water.
corresponding with this is the uh, D uh, new I right here design all the data not for the new slide. Okay, kind of. Okay, let's do it together. A little bit. Okay? Tell me if I'm doing something wrong. Okay. So let's find uh, some temporary thing. TNT um, pi. Move the stuff bigger. Bump. Bump. here and okay 
So, well, function definitions in Bustle are something like def, right? Um, posterior, right? And then how to do prior, the vector, and predictions. And let's call it p because it's too long to add predictions. And outcome. Okay? So now we want to find a posterior distribution given the evidence and predictions. Okay? So we're not going to loop through, the, through that, that's going to be one outcome. This is a single outcome, but we can call this repeatedly for multiple outcomes. Okay? Because we said we have this recursive thing, so we can call, with the prior, we can call this function again. So, example, we can say uh, posterior is uh, basically posterior, posterior is posterior, prior p outcome okay then feed data to predictors get new p then basically so then you can use this recursion basically okay so a new outcome so these are all changing because you get new data every time can even write it like this, for example, if it comes over in time. Yeah. And but this one you cannot generate dynamically. It's okay. Uh, basically, you have some function give uh, outcome to predictors, and then you can say p. So give they all give you a new prediction. So this is how it would work. But this function here is, we are limited in that, we just have all the, the predictions fixed, and we have the outcome, and we have the prior. So here, the only thing we do is, well, we have to calculate the posterior. So basically, you can say posterior is equal to prior, initially. Yeah. And we have a number of models, and is, I think, len uh, prior, number of models. And what else do we have? We have, uh, well, we have to have the data for uh, i is 1 to n how do we write how do we like a loop in python does anybody remember hmm? how do we like a loop in python for n uh, in range for yes. n in range 1 yeah. or 0 that's from 0 or 1 zero. But, but you can't use n right because then you, you can use uh, for i yeah, yeah. And it defaults to 0 so then you have to use an n yeah you can use write n yeah and n okay yeah. and we find yeah. then yeah. this yeah. thing great and now what we have to write is well posterior i right time equal p of i and outcome okay so that's how we say it works okay this is basically probability of uh, according to model i that y t is equal to i given all the data okay okay but this is not really posterior distribution because it's not normalized to one, so the usual trick is to oh, something happened. Oh, oh. That's why I don't like that. Uh, okay, so the usual trick is to write this as well as a sum. Okay, but sum works already, so z. Zero, and then at the end you say okay. So now it all sums to one. Okay, this is what we want, and that's that's basically the function. Okay, that gives you posterior distribution. And why do we care so much about posterior distribution? Why do I talk about it so much? Well, the first thing is that the posterior gives you a direct representation of what you think is the right world model, which is nice. Okay, it's nice and useful. Uh, we'll see later. The second is that we already have some very nice properties about Bayesian methods, so we can prove in some way that Bayesian methods are optimal uh, for prediction. And let's take it from the beginning. Let's say you have some observation sequence, like before, some sequence of data from 1 until time capital T. 
let's say that there is one model in all our models that is perfect or the best possible model okay so if we knew this model from the beginning then you could just choose that all the time and make predictions it's like having a one weather forecaster that's the best always follow that one and ignore every, everybody else okay now <coughs> but what we actually usually do in bayesianism is we don't just pick one model but we average over all the models okay what does this mean it means that let me just write it so basically what we write is in Bayesianism we have a lot of models and we care about what happens under any model what what's going to happen and the usual way we do that is to sum over all the models okay, so every model gives you a different prediction but you have a belief about every model that is different and you average all the models together so if this is an arbitrary belief i'm not talking about prior or posterior it can be at any point in the sequence but usually we, when we talk about this we talk about the posterior okay so this is what you usually do because you don't want to commit on a specific model because some of them might be very wrong some of them are very good but you don't know so you have to weigh them according to their current probability so what we usually do is this and specifically in our case let's say that we have a uniform prior so initially we place an equal probability to every model that's one over n then our prediction about what's going to happen in the future or about any po possible sequence is that the probability of the sequence is going to be equal to the probability of the average on average of the sequence according to all the models so the model i gives this probability that's fine another model gives another probability that's fine we just average all of them <coughs> so now what we can do actually is if the best model is this one this is the one that gives the highest probability okay then you can actually bound the ratio the difference between this probability and the probability given by the average model or the average probability of all the models and it's actually very very simple so this is sum right so the sum of positive things so if we remove any number of things then it becomes a smaller sum okay so if we remove everything else apart from the best model yeah then we get this so the sum becomes smaller so the 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 ratio becomes bigger so we can bound this ratio by this and then here you have to see the same model twice so this is just log n okay so now we know that the difference in log probability ratio between the actual best model and the average version model no matter how it happens no matter how many data you have is always logarithm in the number of models which is nice but of course it's a, it's a very simple result but it also it's only useful for this case where you have a finite number of models if you have an infinite number of models then this doesn't make sense anymore it just becomes infinite anyway so uh, we don't want to use this result but it's still nice and because of this you can also prove that very easily that the KL divergence between the real model and the Bayesian model is bounded by this and the same for the expected kill divergence and so on so we basically can prove that Bayesian methods converge always to the best model in some sense or that if you are Bayesian then you're almost as good as if you already knew the model in some way mm -hmm. because the averaging actually helps and you cannot use any kind of averaging so here we use this one over n okay if we start from some other belief saying okay let's put slightly more on this model because I think that model is might be better and it turns out that that model is actually true then you basically assign a higher mass to that model but a lower mass to something else right so when you the worst case scenario would be that the model for which you assign the lowest probability actually is true and then your uh, regret let's call it uh, scales according to this scales according to the minimum probability you place on a model which is worse but anyway this is the kind of calculation you have to think about when you th when you uh, try and prove something like this for an infinite number of models because you cannot place a high probability on everything you have to place some small probability on the most unlikely models and then you have to kind of bound the error for those models but this is the only thing you have to know at the moment for Bayesian 
uh, optimality. Some other results show that uh, for continuous models, the posterior distribution converges to something that looks like a Gaussian, and the other asymptotic results, but this holds for any, for any amount of data. So it's very simple. Okay, so that's all about Bayesianism, and we will talk a little bit about decision making finally. Okay, um, but the main point I want to make in the Bayesianism part was to ensure that you understand that we are uncertain about what is reality, right? And that's why we use right now anyway this subjective concept of probability. And when we make decisions, we have to also take into account the uncertainty we have about the reality. That's the main problem we want to solve in reinforcement learning. Okay, so very simple uh, exercise, kind of. We have three problems, uh, three different problems. And the first is choose different um, foods, okay? So, Johan, what do you like of these three foods? Um, cheeseburger. Cheeseburger, okay. <laughs> and, and... <laughs> yeah, maybe oatmeal. Oatmeal, okay. Cheeseburger. <laughs> 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 okay. So now, does not anybody like shoe stroming? <laughs> Are you like it? It's fine, it's fine. It's fine. But you prefer it over A or C? Or B? <laughs> no, that, that's a question, right? So if I was going to order food for everybody here and had to be the same food, right? Which food should I order? So let's put it this way. So, so everybody would be happy with a cheeseburger. Maybe people would, eat, but people would probably not like to have just so strong, right? Right. So this is one thing where uh, you can have preferences among things, right? And you can decide what is your preference, and then you would need to make, let's say, a choice, but not for one person, but for more more people. How are you going to make this choice, right? If you just give a score, for example, then you can add up all the scores together, yeah. And you can call this score a utility. We will talk about that later. And you can try and maximize this average utility of everybody. So, but then that doesn't stop anybody for saying, okay, my utility for Sustorming is one billion and zero for everything else. So then you have to buy Sustorming, right? So, so how do we get around this? I don't know. So this is one one problem. Okay, uh, maybe we should not do that. If you have many people, maybe we should care about maximizing for the worst uh, person. So there's some, but that's allergic to. Cheeseburger, so we cannot order cheeseburger. Have to be something else, right? Uh, let's talk about money, okay? Money, okay. So Hannes, what do you like of these <laughs> of these I things? Like the ten million bit. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's an interesting. Are you I see. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Does anybody not take the bitcoin? <laughs> Everybody wants <laughs> <laughs> because I mean one thing about financial uh, assets is, is this right so the utility of a financial asset so the more you have the less a bit more of it matters right? so if you have a million dollars another million kids another million so so much but if you have zero dollars then one million is a lot right so if you are in debt it's even even better to have some money now the other thing about investing is the future right so let's say now I have ten million bitcoins that's great. But then what's going to happen tomorrow? Will they be worth anything? Will I be able to sell them and get actual money? No. So there is this discounting. Or if I have dollars or SEC, SEC uh, has inflation. So I have 10 million SEC now, but maybe they will not be worth so much in five years. So maybe I prefer to change them into dollars. Or I don't know. Uh, and the third is kind of completely uh, arbitrary. So here there is no monetary thing that you can assign, but just a pure personal preference. and. And that's the whole thing. And the framework for deciding among those things is what we call utilities and rewards. So each one of these is a reward. You can choose it directly in this case. Let's say you could choose it. And the idea is that there's some utility function. If you have a reward, it's worth something to you. And the idea is that you prefer something to something else if and only if the utility for that for you is higher than the other. So if you say you prefer BTC to USD, then you think that it's worth more somehow. There is some some inherent worth for you, okay? Maybe just having it, you like it. Maybe you don't do it with anything with it. It doesn't matter. Just personal, okay? It's nothing is objective here. Exactly in the same way that nothing is objective in the in the Bayesian framework, where you just have some belief about something, 
Here we also have these utilities and nothing is objective. We just have our own personal utility for things, okay? Sure strumming or Bitcoin. Some people are strange. Okay, so I said I said before, this is a little exercise and let's try and think about common utility function. This is more a discussion exercise. Uh, maybe for people in the back, you know, people in the phone have spoken a bit. Let's say we want to choose the food. So do you think there's a way to define a common utility function so that we can choose the, the best food for everybody? Just one with one number. So everybody gives numbers for everything maybe, or, or opinions, and then you want to uh, get a number. So you want to assign a number to each choice. How would you assign a number to each choice in a simple way? Count. Count. Like voting, you yeah. mean? Yeah, voting. Yeah, voting. <laughs> <laughs> voting is the is the one simple way. So if you say I prefer simple voting, yeah, so how many likes cheeseburger, how many likes two strumming, you can have one vote per person, per item, or uh, you can have people voting for multiple items. You again run into problems of of choice. There is no kind of optimal way to do this uh, or best way um, there would be always some allocation which uh, doesn't satisfy uh, some actions that you would like so there is no way to do that basically we, we can define utility for people individuals but then when you go to populations it kind of breaks down so then you go into this of what is fair for people and what is not fair yeah. okay but it's important to think about that before we actually go into any algorithms just to, because in reinforcement learning there is usually a very specific definition of what is utility and there are historical reasons for that and computational reasons for it. But it doesn't mean that we have to stick to that all the time or we have to uh, think about utility all the time. Okay? I'm putting it in context here. Okay? But uh, why do you need to only order one, one, and one? Sure, everybody can just order what they want. That's fine. There's no reason why not. But if you're going to order from one place, then it has to be one thing. Sorry. Or we, we decide to go, on, go all together to a, to a concert. Everything's well, free. You can have maybe 50% cheaper than that. No, so if we're going to all go to a concert together, then we're all going to a concert together. Mm -hmm. So we have to go to one concert. We cannot go to three concerts. We can go maybe, but not enough time. Okay. Okay. So now we have to talk about simple decisions. It becomes more complicated when you have multiple outcomes that affect your reward. So here it's slightly more complicated than later, but I want to make it kind of clear. So here we have two actions. Uh, one is carry umbrella and now no umbrella. And you have two outcomes, rain or no rain, okay? Like before. So depending on what you choose and depending on what happens, you are wet or dry. Now you would like to say, to make some decision about it, and if you want to be formal and you have to assign this utility function to every possible reward. So here you don't care so much, dry your carrying the umbrella, you get say you have zero utility. You don't care if it rains or not, you have your umbrella. Now if you don't have your umbrella, you don't really don't like it, so it's minus 10. And if it's not raining and you don't have your umbrella, you're feeling nice, if you don't have the umbrella, it's a bit nicer, so you put a one. But now, this is not enough for you to make a decision. So you have to, so here if you don't take the umbrella, you have a zero for sure. But if you take it, if you don't take it, you have either minus 10 or one. So you have to have a way of deciding among those criteria, yeah? So there is a maximum rule where you say, well, if I select an action and say that the, let's say Thor is very evil and he wants to do the worst possible thing for me given what I choose. Well, if I choose this one, then he doesn't, doesn't matter what he does. But whenever I, don't take the umbrella, then it rains, for sure. Okay, so then I have to take the umbrella. Yeah. If you believe that nature is kind of somehow vindictive, okay, you can believe the opposite way. Let's say that your uh, doesn't help very much, but you can say, okay, what if it was opposite? And then if I knew what was going to happen, uh, but nature selected the worst possible thing. So even if I knew what was going to happen, then I was performing as as low as possible. So in that case, it would rain all the time, so I would have to take the umbrella anyway. So in this scenario, the minimax and maximum choice are the same. Uh, there is there's no difference. Um, but since we're talking about utilities, and we talked about probabilities before, let's not put the, 
put the two together and say, okay, let's say, let's say there's some probability for rain, fine. And then we can calculate the expected utility. Okay. So expected utility, just expectation of the utility, given the action we take. And the first action is basically uh, rain or no rain, uh, umbrella or no umbrella. Here's the probability of the event given our action. In this specific example, the event doesn't depend on our action. Okay, unless, again, we assume some uh, uh, god that uh, responds to what we do. Uh, but whether it turns or not is independent of on whether we take the umbrella or not. And this is the probability of rain given that we uh, take the umbrella or not rain given that we don't take the umbrella and so on. And this is the reward we take for each one of those cases. And it's, this reward has a utility. Yeah? So here is the matrix of utilities corresponding to these rewards. And this is actually the expected utility for the two actions. So we prefer to take the umbrella because the probability of rain is quite high, 20%. If it was like, say, 1%, then we would have a positive value here and we, we would actually uh, not take the umbrella. Okay? So this is quite simple. But another thing that is kind of interesting is what is the right utility function for things like money? Yeah. We kind of went through that a little bit before. Um, but let's go through it now. So let's say that I was going to give you 100 sec or maybe flip a coin, a fair coin, and give you 200 sec or nothing, right? So how many of you would prefer A? Almost everybody. Mm -hmm. Does anybody prefer B? Okay. I tell you the coin is really fair, okay? <laughs> so I'm not cheating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, uh, Okay, so the basic thing that we have in, in, in decision theory with expected utility is that we prefer it to be when expected utility is higher, okay? And that's fine. And it's the same thing that we've had before. And in this example we had, the assumption is that the, this utility is increasing. So with more reward, with more money, you prefer more money than less money. Not necessarily true, but let's say it's true. And then depending on what you think about this expectation, you get slightly different results. So let me just put that through. Um, okay, five, two, one. Yeah, that's the right one. Okay. So if you have uh, some utility function for money, okay, that is convex, and here is the amount of money you have, this is your reward, okay. And here's the utility you have for the amount of money. So let's say here is the hundred sec, and here's two hundred sec. Okay. And it can be convex or cave or linear. So when it is actually linear, then it is actually true that your expected reward for an amount of money, your expected utility for an amount of money for any given decision is exactly the same as the utility of the expected reward that you get for this decision. But if you are have a concave utility function, then it's uh, this doesn't hold anymore, or you have a convex utility function. So you have a convex utility function, you prefer to gamble. So the convex utility function is here. Yeah. So if I tell you I'll, I'll give you 150 kroner, instead of 100 or 200 with some probability, then your utility for 150 kroner is going to be here, which is lower than the average between the two. So here is the line of the average between the two. So this is the standard way to model risk aversion and uh, risk preferences in individuals, saying that if, especially about money, so you prefer more money, uh, more risk if your utility function for money is convex, and you prefer less risk if it's concave. So typically people that take life insurance, they have a, a, a concave utility function, while the insurance company that provides insurance, because it's a big institution, 
they are kind of risk neutral, so they have a really linear uh, unity function. And that's why actually insurance exists in some sense. Yeah. Uh, does it have to do with uh, the variance here? The what? Is there a relation with this convex and concave function with variance? The variance of uh, the expectation. The variance? Because in, the, in this example... So the variance is something uh, is a different way of dealing with it. So there are, peop there are risk measures that are more varied. Okay, so it's here. So if I'm going to give you for sure something, yeah? So if you are risk neutral, then getting exactly 100 kroner is exactly the same for you as getting a 100 in expectation. So you don't care about the variance, okay? If your utility function is uh, concave, then the variance affects you a lot. But if it's convex, then you prefer more variance. So if I give you for sure 150, actually you don't like it. You want uh, to have the gamble. You prefer the gamble. Somehow it's worth more to you to have, with some probability, double the money than to have for sure in the middle. Yeah. So that's basically the thing. You don't directly relate to variance, but just you specifically do it through this function. So it doesn't. It's not a direct connection with variance. But in economics, they do study this in terms of risk and variance. And the usual thing is to have this to be a logarithmic curve, actually, especially for money. OK, so that's all about preferences. And the last thing to talk about for preferences is regret. And you go out, you don't take your umbrella, you say, oh, I should have taken my umbrella, right? And that's a standard idea. So for that purpose, what we do is we basically define the difference between the best action in hindsight, so what I could have done if I knew that it's going to rain, minus what actually happened, okay, what, how much we actually got. So in this matrix, you can see that if it rains and you don't take your umbrella, you have a regret of 10. Yeah, because you had minus 10, you could have gotten a zero. If it doesn't rain and you take the umbrella and say, well, I could have left at home, so you have a regret of one. You can also calculate expected regret by just multiplying over with the probabilities of every outcome. And this gives you uh, an expected regret that is lower for the first action. So here, in this scenario at least, we see that the expected regret idea and the expected utility idea give you the same answer. So maximizing the one seems to be the same as minimizing the other. So maximizing expected utility is the same as minimizing expected regret for this scenario. Uh, is that always the case? I, well, this is your exercise. Uh, so the decision A star maximizes expected utility, then only if it also minimizes expected regret. Okay. So. Uh, I guess we can close with this exercise. So we, we still have some things to talk about, I guess. But we'll talk about it on Thursday, so it's not so much. And then we'll talk about, we'll do some exercises more hands-on. So yeah, try and, and prove that now. And we probably don't finish it until 3. We can have discussion until then, and we can come up with your proofs on Thursday. Yeah, sounds good? Or non-proofs. So here, the expected regret is defined like this, right? Probability of uh, the outcome given your action. If you want, you can simplify it and forget about the condition on the action. But it should be the same. So when you maximize this thing, you minimize that thing. And when you minimize this thing, you maximize the other thing. Make sure I approve it. Maybe I forgot to put it correctly. Okay, just to uh, remind you, because you probably I should have left it on the same slide. So this is the regret, okay? So I'll just write it down on the board as well.
bit of fitting action A when Omega happens is the maximum where all the actions Okay, so this is the regret, and expected regret is just the same thing, but multiplied over with the probability of every outcome omega. Yeah. So you can see it there. the regret and uh, root is the maximum over this part yeah so it's a different thing from a right maximum a star maximum thing you can get in hindsight minus the thing you actually get but you put a star in okay. the row as well yeah like this So this argument here appears there, right? Mm -hmm. But here you maximizing over this. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't depend on A. Yeah, just I think you should just remove that. Otherwise, it doesn't work. So just say probability of the outcome, the probability of the outcome and the action. Now I have to think about it again.
Yeah, definitely forget about this. Just talk about uh, probability of omega without the condition on A. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Sorry. Not for this definition. But uh, the regard is given A in the fundamental. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I don't need the regard. Yeah, you don't need the A on that side. Mm. Okay, so uh, I can fix that. What, what is the error? Like, what was the error? So the error is basically that uh, this okay. thing, you have to assume that there is independence here. So the probability of the outcome, the outcome doesn't depend on the action. Otherwise, it doesn't seem to work, I think. Well, that's, the, that's the problem if you even if it's independent. Like, because what you've written there is just expected value. Yeah. Uh, there the was no problem, like, uh, sure, it may be, may be P of omega given A is P of omega, but... Yeah, that's all, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the only thing. So if it's just P of omega given A, then you have a, a kind of a term that I forgot about, which doesn't work. I think it will work, even if there were a term. Oh, yeah? Okay. Maybe the first time I drew it, it was correct. Did you write it down? Anyway, so regret is something that has various slightly different definitions in, in slightly different contexts. Uh, but this result is kind of simple. So uh, it does rely on the fact that this is independent. So you can think of omega as something that holds true or not, depending on what you do, and then it's okay. Like, what is the real model? That's the kind of thing where it works. And this is the kind of case where we actually use regret. There are a bunch of different models, and or real, the real world, let's say one of them is the real world, and we measure regret against the real world. Uh, so what would be the utility you would get if you knew what's the real world compared to what you actually get? Yeah. And this regret bound kind of tell you how difficult it is to learn a problem. If, it's, if you have, have very high regret, expected regret, when you don't know the model of the world, then it tells you that it's difficult to learn the problem. 
it's a nice summary of uh, of how things can learn, and it ties together the learning part and the and the decision making part. Because maybe there are some things about the world that you don't care about to maximize your utility. So most of the theoretical results will will look like in a month or so uh, that talk about regret there in this setting. But the actions are a bit more complicated, so they're not as simple actions like this. Okay, so we're kind of running out of time, so I need to talk to somebody, I guess, now. And we can meet again on Thursday, and we'll continue with uh, decision rules, so not simple decisions, but decision rules, which depend on some data. And we'll slowly go into the reinforcement learning problem, basically. Okay? Very slowly. And yeah. We'll basically start with full observation problems where, like, having weather forecast and deciding every day whether or not to take the umbrella or not. And then moving to the partial information problem, which is reinforcement learning. And I will share the slides in the video. Uh, as soon as I'm finished with it, yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. One more question. Yeah. Could you briefly comment on the, the course outline and the project we were going through there? Ah, uh, yes. That's something I should have mentioned from the beginning. Uh, thanks for reminding me. So what we're going to do is kind of continue this kind of lectures and assignments and kind of in-class work. Um, there are going to be four assignments. Uh, not this week, but for the next four weeks, and then a mini project to be taken by teams of two to four people. Yeah, and uh, you can exchange two assignments for one week of uh, lecture and discussion leading. But now, Aristide, Hannes, and Dave are already doing this twice, so they're not doing any assignments. They are actually doing preparing their assignments. So, because this course is too small to actually get teaching credit, you can basically get course credit by doing teaching. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's the other way around. Uh, but uh, I think it's a learning process for everybody. So, I'll, I'm going to be here for all the lectures, apart from next week where I have to go somewhere. Location, actually. But uh, I trust you guys will be able to handle it. It's very basic. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, I'll keep uh, an eye out on things. Okay, so it was assignment that you didn't. So assignment or lecturing. Uh, or, or during the lecture. Yeah, during the lecture and preparing the assignments and, and stuff for that week. Uh, so it's going to be four assignments, not very big. Yeah. And then a small project. The project will build on the assignments because you will use OpenAI framework for, for the practical assignments. Next week is going to be some kind of theoretical little assignments. But from then on, it's going to be, I think, more practical ones. And you will need to use OpenAI framework, and the project will be basically to develop an agent that is very general and you just put in some environment, and you don't know what the environment is going to be, and it has to perform as well as possible. So that's the project. So it doesn't have a goal or anything, you just have to make the most general agent possible. And that's all. Yeah, they want the room. Yeah. So 